Hey y'all, welcome to the Coyote Trapping School Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Chris Pope, coming at you live from right here in Georgia. Um, this is not live, this is pre-recorded, but I'm here nonetheless. Um, first off, if you haven't, if you're strictly a podcast listener and don't follow any kind of social, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, then I don't know how many of you there are out there, but if you are, if that's your case, then you missed out on our latest greatest unveil, the Coyote Trapping School original product. Here we got the short liner trapping bag. Um, so you can see a YouTube video specifically on this and uh, you can also order. I'm making these as we speak. That's why I got kind of a mess here, although I think I cut most of that out of the video if you're watching on YouTube. If you're just listening on the podcast, this is the coolest, best trapping bag on the market and even off the market. So. Um, you can look it up. Just go to coyotetrappingschool.com slash shortliner trapping bag or just Google shortliner trapping bag. You'll get there one way or the other. And um, you see the features and, and all. I'm really excited about it. And uh, <clears throat> I think you will be too. I got a lot of good feedback on it. So probably a few more things I may tweak and play with a little bit. But um, it's a it's a good bag that I think is going to gonna really um, benefit a lot of folks if you like keeping all your tools completely inside your bag, nothing sloshing out or spilling out, then uh, that's the bag for you. So and that's the that was the whole my whole premise in making it. Uh, other thoughts for this week, um, one thing that I saw, I got an email if you're, I don't know if it was just a Wild Fur Shippers Council members, but uh, North American Fur Auctions sent out a, a notice that um, they had to let go some of their employees, uh, some of their staff, I'm not sure how I, I just read the, the kind of the briefing. I didn't dig into it, um, so I'm not sure. You know how wide-reaching. I know there were some of the the North American um, staff that was affected. Or they're all North American, I guess, but the U.S. staff that was affected. Um, so I just thought that was, I guess, kind of um, not surprising given the fur market. Um, but a little bit surprising given the economy and I guess you know I hate it for, for those folks that have lost a job um, but from my perspective you had to be in that situation this is probably a good time for that there's unemployment at its lowest rate and and um, you know everywhere you go there's folks looking for looking for uh, good help so hopefully those folks will all land back on their feet but that's just a, I guess kind of an indicator of of the fur market, you know, the, the economy is booming, but with so much ranch fur and, and primarily ranch fur on the market and just flooding the market, that uh, the fur market is, is not great. And it's kind of funny if you look back, and I'm no historian or no expert, but it seems like the, the peaks and valleys of the fur market have been almost uh, inversely related to the peaks and valleys of the other markets. I remember reading in Fur Fish and Game. Um, talking about um, guys that were, you know, young high school, even middle age, middle school aged kids that, that lived during the depression, and um, they were making as much or more money on their small trap lines um, for mink and muskrat and raccoons and fox and whatnot as uh, their dads were working, you know, factory jobs or whatever work that they could get for, you know, they were m making more on their trap line and a week than, than folks were making in a month on a, you know, if the, if somebody had a job that they could get during the depression. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how, you know, the fur boom in the late 70s, early 80s, and how that mirrored the economy, but um, it's just, uh, just interesting, like I say, that, that um, with the, the boom, the, the booming economy that we've seen, that we have right now, that the fur market is is in uh, the straits that it's in. So anyway, like I said, I thoughts and prayers with those folks that have lost their jobs, and hopefully they will uh, land on their feet. Today, I wanted to talk a little bit about trap line safety. Not the sexiest, most exciting topic out there, but um, definitely something that I think we needs to be in the backs of all of our minds. And uh, trap line safety can mean, you know, totally different things in in, in my neck of the woods and a lot of the southeast. If you're running a, a vehicle trap line, especially a short, you know, before after work vehicle trap line, realistically, there's probably not a whole lot of 
there's definitely safety issues, but they're relatively minor for the most part compared to if you're running, you know, a sled dog line in Alaska, which I don't know that anybody, if you're listening on here and running a trap line in Alaska, give me a shout because uh, I think that is awesome. Um, but even, you know, up in the, up in the, the Northeast, you're dealing with a lot of snow. It can get remote up in Maine and things. And, um, in the West, you know, those folks out there that are running bobcat lines and stuff, you get up into the high country, I mean, there's definitely some some um, hazards there. And then even in the southeast, um, you know, I ran in, in Arkansas, I ran a, uh, a water trap line out of my boat in um, not a super remote area, but when you're, when you're talking about, you know, boats and, you know, that's, that's a lot different. It's not near as accessible as as a vehicle, you know, in a, you know, if you're just running in farm country, so um, I'd say that that would be a higher risk trap line than you know running chicken coyote traps on the back forty of Farmer John's cow pasture. So uh, a couple of the things to that, that just kind of came to mind as I was thinking about that is, you know, if, if you're running, you know, like. Like me in my day to day, for the most part, you know, I'm running out of my truck. I never get very far from my truck. So, the biggest thing, and I guess I should start out, the biggest thing with any of these trap lines is to make sure somebody knows where your trap line is. That way, if for some reason you don't show up, um, you don't make it home on time or something, you know, somebody's at least got a, an idea of where you're starting, you know, where to start looking. And uh, for me, that's pretty easy because a lot of times my wife, you know, on the weekends, my wife will go with me. And, um, she's kind of gotten to know the farms that I trap, and, and so even if she doesn't go when I'm setting a trap line, if I tell her, you know, I'm on so-and-so farm, she at least knows where that's at. Um, so, but with a, with a road trap line, or, or a vehicle trap line, I guess, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the concern or issues can, can run along with your vehicle. Um, and in more remote areas, you know, like the north woods of Maine, <clears throat> you could be running a vehicle trap line up there, but you could be miles and miles from the nearest help or anything. So just kind of some standard maintenance and, and uh, you know, regular vehicle precautions, making sure your flat, your spare tires aired up, um, having a good jack. That's one thing that I've had issues with, not even on the trap line, but having a good jack that you can, uh, you can actually get your vehicle up high enough that you can get the tire on and off. Um, so actually, I started carrying a jack stand. I just got a single jack stand in my toolbox in addition to the jack because um, for whatever reason, it never fails. It seems like whether it's the the surface, the road, or the, the shoulder, or wherever that I wind up having a flat tire on. Um, not that it happens that often, but it happened within the last six months and so it feels like it was just you know right on the top of my brain but it never fails that I can never quite get that jack up quite high enough one another thing I'll carry is at least one two by six um, just something that I can put under that jack to get that little extra bit of clearance and uh, also you know that'll spread the spread the base of it out so that you know it, it doesn't press down in the mud or, or dirt is bad because you know if you're running trap line in the winter time a lot of times we're dealing with wet conditions and so you go to start jacking your truck up and a lot of times just sit there and watch the jack just sink as you're pumping your truck doesn't budge but that jack's just steady sinking so having something that you can put under that jack to hold it in place and kind of stabilize it a little bit um, to where your truck goes up instead of the jack going down can be a big a big help um, making sure you're never running low on fuel uh, you know, I've heard people, and I, I try to encourage my wife about this, that treat the half tank mark as the full tank, uh, or, or as the empty mark, you know, and once you see you get below half tank or two half a tank, let's go ahead and fill up. And I, so admittedly, I am not great at that at all. I am, a, I'm a pusher, um, like the, the Seinfeld episode of Kramer, trying to see how far the see how far the, the gauge will go and breaking the needle off. I I got a pretty good idea of just the amount of gap that I've got right after that empty line before I 
know that I'm in serious trouble. And I don't honestly, I've never run it out, knock on wood, yet. So um, I try, I've tried to be better about that as of late, but that's, that's something, because inevitably, if you push it and say, well, I, you know, it's gonna cost me a few extra minutes to fuel up now, maybe I'll do it after I check the trap line. And then you wind up getting stuck and have to lock it in four wheel drive or, or have to put it in four wheel drive to keep from getting stuck. And you do get stuck. And so you're rocking back and forth thinking, man, every time I'm pressing this pedal, I'm getting a little bit closer. Um, so just, I, it, all of this is common sense things, but as men, I know a lot of times we try to push the push the envelope a little bit so just I'm just throwing this stuff out there to remind us and, and maybe any younger folks that, that are uh, you know have aren't necessarily set in their ways and still kind of kind of feeling things out can get a few of these precautions as, as habits built in before you realize uh, only because of uh, experiences that you need to build these habits in but a cell phone charger you know most everybody's got a cell phone charger in the vehicle and you know, most places you don't have an issue having service so if you do have a breakdown or a flat tire or whatever you can at least call somebody or not sit, not even so much a flat tire but getting stuck um, and then my grandmother she's she's one that's always been uh, adamant about making sure you have some water and a blanket in your vehicle and I've uh, knock on wood I've never had gotten to the point where I needed any of that but I, I try to keep uh, I try to keep both of those in the vehicle. I, in fact, I've gotten this, uh, you know, kind of some company gifts and things. A little, just just a little fleece blanket that actually rolls up, rolls up, and it's pretty compact. And it just it's perfect for throwing under under your back seat or in a toolbox or something just to, to have if you get in a bind. And like I said, knock on wood, I've never needed that. Hopefully, I never will. But um, just little things like that that until you get in those situations. You don't really think that it's that important, but um, it definitely can be helpful. Having a flashlight, that's one thing that I've gotten I've gotten adamant about in all my vehicles and even in my wife's vehicle and not some junky six volt Walmart lantern, but a good flashlight. And one, one thing I've also done is um, put lithium batteries in them instead of alkaline because if you don't use something regular where you have to replace those alkaline batteries, invariably, my experience is when I go to use it and turn it on, it won't turn on and I'll open it up and the batteries are all corroded and it's just frustrating. So the lithium, I'm no battery expert, but my lithiums haven't corroded at all like my, my alkalines have. So that's a, that's been a big shift for me and, and one thing I've tried to, tried to make a point of doing is, you know, because the, the lithiums last longer too. So. Um, that's been a big plus and then you know just in general especially if you're running at night a headlight you know a couple of headlights backup batteries things like that just to just to um, make sure you got you know with trapping it never hurts to have a backup of everything so and one thing I didn't write down but as I was talking through that I, I was thinking about um, you know one of the one of the biggest risks on a, on a road trap line or, or on a vehicle trap line is getting stuck and it's you know it's not so much an issue of if you get stuck or um, you know using four-wheel drive but especially if you get stuck to the point where you need to call somebody to try to pull you out that is a really dangerous situation that a lot of people don't um, don't realize you know I, I didn't realize how dangerous of a situation like that that was um, until I was actually um, a friend of mine got stuck on he, he got off in the ditch um, just one of those old wood roads and, and it was winter time and he shouldn't have been there but he, he got a little bit too far off to the edge and just that the shoulder of the road slipped and gave way and he slid off into the ditch and he could not just not get out just some old gumbo nasty mud and uh, he was stuck and so he called me and I came over I got there and go to hook up on the pickup and got a um, we had a strap a tow strap which you know, supposedly is safer than a cable it's a little bit easier to handle it and uh, you know you get, you get a cable which really you're only using cable if you've got a winch and a chain 
and then toe straps. And so the easiest thing to do with a toe strap is wrap it, wrap it around itself. If you've got shackles, that's that's the best thing to do. I, I think I'm no super expert, but um, the best thing to do if you've got you know the hooks on the front of the vehicle, and then um, you know if you can shackle it to, to something on the back of the vehicle, if, or if you've got one of those uh, hitches that has a you know you can swap it out and put a big shackle on that, that would be good. Not really thinking about it, we just slipped the the toe strap over the ball and said you know that'll be done that before no issue well um, we weren't getting anywhere wouldn't you know you, you start out just trying to pull and get them trying to trying to um, get some traction and you know pull and see if you can pull them enough to where all of a sudden their truck gets a bite and they can come up and come out that wasn't working, so spun it around. We couldn't, weren't getting anywhere forward, so spun it around and tried to go from the back, and that wasn't working. So we ultimately, we wound up, you, you resort to trying to snatch, you know, just to try to get something moving, and uh, actually wound up snatching, and the ball, uh, there, was, there was some slop in the ball that we didn't realize to begin with, and the ball on his truck broke and came back and hit the... Uh, hit the, t the tailgate of my truck and put, I mean, right through the, the front, you know, the outside, the outside of the tailgate, just poof, put a hole right through there. And when we got looking at that, the, the direction and the angle, man, if he, and he was actually in the, in the truck, but, um, if it had been, if it had been two or three inches higher, that thing would have went right through the back, the back glass and, right into the driver's seat. And I mean, that was that was pretty sober looking at that thinking, man, that was and, and after that we just we just quit and we uh he called a record or actually I think they got a motor grader the next day come in and, and lift the front end of the truck up and pull it out. But um you know between that, between if you got a winch or or chain, whatever you're using and that you know if, if that especially the winch that cable breaks, um I, I've seen folks that put a, a jacket or shirt or something over the cable in the middle just to keep from it if it breaks it doesn't um you know there's something to keep it from snapping all the way back and you know you gotta be standing clear of that that to me that's probably one of the one of the most dangerous situations that that we really you don't think about um in the moment when you're trying to get unstuck you're frustrated and muddy and everything else but well in those you know, at, at work we call those upset conditions when, you know, everything's going wrong and you're just trying to get something figured out. That's when you're most likely to let your guard down, right? And, and you know, do something that you know is probably not safe to do, but just in the heat of the moment, I'll, you know, it'll, I'll, just, I'll just stand here and hold it, whatever. And, uh, you know, it, it only takes one time to, to cost you big time, so... The, the, I don't know if that was the best illustrated story, but um, make sure, I guess the moral of that story is, make sure you're securing your your tow rope or whatever, your hook on your winch, whatever, to something that's solid, not just wrapping it around the ball of your trailer hitch or, or on the back of the pickup. So firearm safety, of course, is paramount. Um, you know, that's, that's as deadly as a vehicle. And a lot of times we're more cautious with guns than we are with vehicles, to be honest. But, but um, you know, that's that's something there again that only takes one one miss mess up, one one misstep, and and serious injury or, or life threatening injury. So, you know, with the Ten Commandments, firearm safety, always treat a gun like it's loaded. Keep it pointing in a safe direction. Um, especially, you know, I reevaluate. Once you have kids, you reevaluate how you do things, and you know. Before you have kids, you keep. Personally, my guns were pretty much always loaded, um, and I always handled them safely. They were on safe, and but if I was, if if I was, you know, had one in the bedroom for security, which I, I still do, but I keep it out of reach. Um, but just thinking through and making sure that you got all the all the 
hazards all the potential areas covered because man that's you know that's that's one thing that's always especially if you've got kids around it's always um heartbreaking and disheartening to hear when you know a child finds a gun and, and fires it and you know especially if there's there's injury or anything involved there so um, that can cannot be overstated enough of making sure that you're those things are uh you know you're you're practicing the utmost in in firearm safety and and you know a lot of times now i'll keep my magazine loaded but i don't keep one in the chamber just for that matter and i'm always keeping it on safe another another big watch out is um skinning in general but especially if you're skinning on the trap line um because if you're skinning you know if you're skinning at home there's probably somebody there you probably got some stuff that if you do nick yourself or cut yourself you can you know quickly get the bleeding stopped call some you know call somebody if you you know if it was that bad um, but if you're out on the trap line even if you call somebody how the heck are you going to tell them where you're at you know to to uh, get anywhere so um one thing that i always do and it well i guess this is much a, a safety aspect from um you know wildlife and, and handling blood as anything but i always wear rubber gloves when i'm skinning um, from the standpoint of you know these animals carry different diseases and and i don't i don't want to run the risk of contracting a um you know any kind of bloodborne pathogen through raccoon blood or anything else but one thing that i've also noticed is that little thin layer as much as it doesn't seem like it would do anything that in the times that i have you know had a slip of the knife a lot of times i've wound up cutting the glove and i think that saved me from cutting my hand so i think that's a good um a good little safety measure there too they make the you know they make those cut resistant gloves and actually when i'm filleting fish sometimes i'll hand i'll use i got one of those that i'll use on my my no knife hand you know as i'm holding if i'm because you never want to cut towards your hand but um sometimes i got one of those that i'll wear but it's that's kind of awkward and bulky for for just regular day-to-day -day skinning you know especially if you're skinning as much as we're skinning so next up talk a little bit about the water trap line like i like i mentioned before you know i was i run a, only once in my life but it was a lot of fun and, and i would definitely uh like to do it again and hope i get a chance to do it again but running running my trap line out of a boat a whole new set of issues and, and a lot of, of it comes back to you know kind of the basics of of safety in your your vehicle your your truck having making sure you got you know extra lights batteries one thing that's pretty handy is those little jump uh, jumper boxes i don't exactly know what you call them but uh, those little battery packs that are charged up that if you if your if your battery dies you can hook that to your battery and jump it off and you don't need a vehicle um, the, the aggravating thing about those the kind of a pain is you got to make sure that they stay charged so that when you need it you can use it um, but that's really handy I, when I when I had my boat I kept one of those in my boat all the time just to make sure I didn't keep it in all the time because uh, my wife can tell you a story about us getting stranded in the middle of the night catching alligators and spent all night out on the salt flats um, wading my boat through the water but that's a that's another story for another time but since then I, I tried to keep something where I could get a uh, you know I could get my boat started again if I needed to um, definitely life vests a fire extinguisher you know a lot of that stuff is required by law anyway um, having the right clothes on trapping season you know with cold weather you get a little bit farther north you may be dealing with snow or ice and things like that so, Having the, being layered up, having the right clothes, and having a good change of clothes, uh, and some fire starting equipment in a waterproof bag. Uh, sometimes, and when I was thinking through it, you know, sometimes it sounds kind of overkill, but like I said, it it is until it's not. It is overkill until you do get wet and need to start a fire to stay warm. So, another big thing is if you're trapping out of a boat, you're probably wearing some kind of waders, and if you're wearing chest waders good thing about those is that's a lot of extra warmth um but you got to be careful because those things fill up it's an anchor uh, so 
I know a lot of them come with, and if they don't, they recommend, and I would recommend at, at the very least wearing a waiter belt. So just a belt that goes around, that cinched pretty snug, so that if you were to go over your waders, it impedes the flow of water into the you know the lower portions of your waders to try to buy you some time so that they don't fill up. Uh, another important thing to keep handy would be a knife, so that if you needed to, you could cut the straps and get out of your waders quickly if you were in that situation. Um, yeah, it's not again, that's not something that's likely to happen a lot, but there too, if you're if you're in the beaver swamp, beaver trapping. It's not that hard to hit one of those beaver runs and poof, be over your head before you know it. Now, I got a, an image burned in my mind when we were in college. We had a, a beaver swamp that we would duck hunt. And in Georgia, duck hunting consists of trying to shoot your limit of wood ducks for the most part. And so that's what we were doing. But by golly, we were die hard about it. And uh, I remember the river flooded. And so the, the swamp that we usually hunted was flooded. That was always we could get our limit we knew we could get our limit easily if the swamps were flooded if it wasn't flooded you were shooting flyover birds if it was flooded you could get the birds coming land and a buddy of mine was walking walking out across one certain part and uh, he was about waist deep and all of a sudden all I saw was the barrel of his gun sticking up over the uh, out of the water and that was just one of those uh oh moments of you know pure panic until I saw his head come back out of the water you know and then it was right back to the truck to get some dry clothes turn the truck on fortunately you know we were, we were close so we just walked in so um but that i mean that's one of those situations where if you're in a little bit more remote area that can be a serious life-threatening you know opportunity right there so um another thing is having a life jacket on you know they make um they make some of those life jackets that are real low profile and you know you don't really notice wearing them and you know, I know a lot of folks, myself included, are, you know, we'll keep a life jacket in the boat to be legal, but we're not going to wear a life jacket. But that's one situation that I, uh, especially by yourself, you're crazy not to wear a life jacket. If you're in a boat by yourself, um, you're crazy not to be wearing a life jacket. And they've even got that. I, I, I thought about trying them, but I haven't. But the, uh, you know, those inflating little life things that just go around your neck and you know a real you know there's nothing to them until some of my some of them i think you can you can manually pull and inflate and then some of them you hit the you, they inflate upon water contact um so that's definitely something too to keep in mind uh, you know for keeping your mobility and range of motion but also being being safe and there again gun safety especially if you're in a boat one thing you don't want to shoot a hole in the bottom of your boat um but if you're wearing a pistol you know i i had i would keep i had a shoulder holster for my 22 and i would keep it kind of tucked in into my waders and uh just i can't screw you know nobody can stress enough making sure that you know proper gun safety is is being followed there and then if you are in the south there's a there's a good likelihood that at some point you're going to run across a snake even during fur trapping season you know uh it's not unusual for us to hit in the 70s and 80s during december and january um, and then if you were to get into doing any kind of nuisance beaver work during the summer you, know, you, you can definitely be in copperhead country and timber rattler, rattler country but you, you get farther south and you get in that cottonmouth country and you can count on it especially around uh around beaver dams and beaver lodges i mean that stuff's just just right for an old moccasin to be coiled up or laid up there um i heard one story a, a friend of mine uh i knew somebody that was doing some beaver trapping in south carolina uh, it was summertime summertime beaver trapping but there was a he actually caught a raccoon in a, a foothold and the raccoon hadn't gone down the down the wire he was kind of got stuck down in a hole and so he reached down to try to grab the the chain to get the get the raccoon up, up to where he could where he could dispatch it and uh as soon as he moved the moved the chain and got the the raccoon to move a cotton mouth struck the raccoon and uh yeah it just it couldn't see the cotton mouth it was they were both in kind of this little hole where you know limited limited sight and all but 
just thinking about how close that was to, you know, if he, if he had a clear shot, he would have shot it and, you know, reached down to try to get it and, um, you know, would have never known that snake was there, but that snake was, that snake was tuned up and, and ready to, ready to strike. So, um, definitely something to keep in mind is something it, snakes it's kind of a funny thing to deal with because you can't you can't go into a, a summertime south georgia beaver trapping job and be paranoid about cotton mouths at the same time you know they're there and it's 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 almost you can't you can't watch for them you can't try to look for them because you won't get anything else done uh, but what I found is if you you know if you're doing your thing for whatever reason, if you come across one, no matter how well he's camouflaged, at least for me, it, you you see him anyway. Um, you know, very rarely have I ever gone through an area and then realized I just I just stepped over a snake. I'm sure it's happened and I didn't know about it. But um, if you if you're going into it thinking about it. Like I said, you're never going to get anything done other than look for snakes because you're just you're too hyped up. So you got to kind of put that out of the back of your mind and just go about your job, go about your business, and and then uh, when you come across one, handle it and keep on going. So not handle it with your hands, but do whatever you're comfortable with, whether that's shooting the snake, shooing the snake off, going around the snake, whatever. I know everybody's got their different preferences. Uh, my preference is a lot of times to shoot him. Uh, or kill them in some way. I, I have I have let a few uh, go. They didn't bother me, and I didn't bother them. But if I was coming back, there was a good chance I was gonna make sure I was gonna cross his path again. And then also, if you're water trapping, you get you're probably dealing with conner bears, and so you know having some kind of safety safety aspect with those. Um, whether it's you know one of the aftermarket safety catches. And there's a, a variety of them out there um, or you know my preference I don't really use one of those safety catches because I use Belial's and their um, their safety catches on the springs are in my opinion they're worth the extra money just because they don't move until you move them you know a lot of the other a lot of the other con bears you know you you use that catch to depress the springs but then when you set the trap as soon as you take that tension you tighten that tension down even farther that hook just falls off falls loose and you're you're you got a hot trap then um, where those belials you depress those you you set that trap and and um, you know depress those springs even more that hook stays right there and that's not going anywhere um, but that's that's definitely an extra watch out just because of the size of those traps and you know if you were to get your arm in one, you know, it takes two hands to set them anyway, so you get one arm in one and then you're you're kind of in a pickle. So um, definitely using caution and being careful there. And uh, and then with, you know, with, with trapping and just wild animals in general and knowing, you know, we're keeping into account that that beaver's on a 10-foot snare or that otter or, or uh, you know, coyote, whatever it is. And, and you get into some areas of the country and you're trapping for the live market and so you're handling live coyotes live foxes things like that just just another opportunity and all that's areas where and I've, I've done it all myself and it's just you gotta you gotta keep from getting complacent you gotta always approach it as how am I gonna do this safely not all right here's another one let's you know and I've seen, I've seen video. I, I, I always used a catch pole. If I was live market trapping, I always used a catch pole. Um, I've seen a lot of guys grab them with their hands and and uh, freehand them and stuff. And good, good for them. Good for good for them. But I'm a, I'm gonna be. I'm gonna use that little bit of extra caution that I that I think is is uh, necessary because I don't want to have a canine sunk through my hand or anything like that. I have to. Have to, I sure don't want to have to go through getting rabies treatments. Um, I've just heard that that is uh, absolutely not fun at all. But uh, one last thing to think about is is some kind of high visibility. Depending on what you are, you know, a lot of times as trappers, we kind of want to lay low and not be noticed. 
Um, but you know, if you're trapping in a in a swamp and you're running <laughs> trap line out of a boat, trapping in a swamp, having you know a brightly colored um, life jacket or something like that can be a, a, a sure no true lifesaver. Or if you're in a remote area, you know, having a, a brightly colored jacket or hat or something. Um, for one, if it's deer season where you're at, you need to be sure you're you've got at least fluorescent orange on or whatever the law may require. Um, but for two, you know, just if something were to happen and somebody had to come looking for you, um, worst case scenario, you know, that's that uh, something to at least consider. Uh, it, to each his own, everybody's got their own outlooks. And, and honestly, when I was water trapping, you know, trapping on, had them on my river line, I never, <coughs> honestly, I never thought about it. I never wore a high visibility. Um, I wore my, I wore my waders. I always wore a life jacket and um but thinking back if i if i were to do it again i i would wear something something brightly colored um and another good option if, if you got it if you can is, is have a partner with you uh, you know two people is always better um share the workload but also if something gets sketchy or dicey you've got something somebody there to uh to lean on so uh and you know, having having somebody to that just that can be a lot of fun trapping with a partner if you get the right partner. So anyway, I hope that give you some give you some food for thought. Um, probably nothing that you haven't heard of before, but um, that I feel like it's something that that you know, trappers as outdoorsmen, you know, and, and passing on the legacy to our children and and other people. You know, we something that we've definitely got to think about because. We do put ourselves in uh, more precarious situations than a lot of other folks do, just by you know being out in the in the environment, being out in the wild, messing with live animals, having you know firearms and knives on us and things like that. Uh, you know we're all competent and capable, but um, just making sure that we're thinking ahead of how do we minimize our risk because we all want to come home. To our families and uh, nobody nobody likes to hear that you know I think there's been enough especially around deer hunting you know there's enough been enough pressure around uh, safety harnesses and things um, I like that'd be interesting I know I might I need to look that up the, the statistics on deer stand injuries and deaths from say you know 20 years ago to now when nobody used a uh, safety harness you know then i was nobody knew what that was and, and now you know that's pretty much the standard and you're crazy if you're not using one um, so just just taking those extra precautions a lot of times it, it may take another an extra minute or two but like i said if something goes wrong you can't get that back so uh, that's that's time well spent so anyway i hope that was hope that was beneficial made you think about something make you rethink something next time you um, next time you get into a situation where your truck stuck or, or whatever, um, I don't want y'all all to keep on trapping and, and come back home and see your families and, and, uh, watch my videos and talk to you and, and keep this, uh, keep this sport and this passion alive. So I hope y'all are having a good summer, keeping it safe out there on the water or, um, whatever you're doing to, to buy the time until trapping season seems like a, a long time, but it'll be here before we know it. So y'all have a good evening. We'll talk to you next time.